Hello, this is Greg Allison of Galactic Gregs coming to you with a special presentation on air turbo rockets by Matthew Thomas of the CFDRC, the Computational Flow Dynamics Research Corporation based in Huntsville, Alabama, speaking to the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society. Now in this talk, he will be talking about them initially mostly for military type air applications. These are rockets that combine elements of a uh, jet and a rocket engine, both liquid and solid fuel, especially for the military applications. So this is mostly a talk about missile and missile applications. He does go into nano, uh, nano satellite launch concepts, and he does mention what I think would be most interesting to this audience toward the end, how the air turbo rocket may be the best suited device for launching a scramjet. And for uh, those of you who are interested in human flight and it, it greatly reducing the cost of human space flight operations, the scramjet may be the ultimate thing, even above and beyond anything Elon Musk is proposing to do today. Once scaled up sufficiently, the scramjet may offer huge potentials because both the air turbo rocket and the scramjet offer very high specific impulse because they will be using oxygen in the atmosphere to the maximum extent possible and oxygen being the heaviest part of the fuel. So this is an interesting technology with many wide applications. He just tends toward that toward the end, but I'm sure that you'll be excited to watch this if you're interested in rockets and rocket engines. And pretty soon I'm planning to do a little rocket 101 class because if I keep talking about rockets, I need to explain rockets because I shouldn't be taking it for granted that everybody here really knows and understands rockets. So I'll do a little rocket 101 and then maybe I'll talk about various rocket engines and kind of take it forward from there. And that'll make it easier in the future when we talk about things like that for everyone to follow along. So everybody, I hope you enjoy this talk. I'm going to be doing a lot of other videos on space, space topics, and perhaps other engineering, science, technical topics. So if you're not already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe and bang the update notification bell. Please uh, click the all option on there so you get updates on all of my videos. And uh, you can support this channel by supporting my sister channel, Green Gregs, whose links I will put below in these videos for now. And later I'll put uh, links that are more tailored to this channel. Hello, I'm Greg Allison. I am the uh, outgoing, now former president once again of HAL 5, founder and former president once again. And uh, I want to introduce you to our new president, an individual who's worked very hard on the committees, uh, been a, a long time volunteer working hard for HAL 5. He's also worked hard on the Power Grid Defense Conferences we've done. He's an awesome individual. And I want everybody to give a big hand to the new president of HAL 5, David Newsom. my first time as the, as the president. I just want to welcome you tonight. And tonight's speaker is, is Matt Thomas from, from CFD Research. And he'll be speaking about his research program, Inside Air Turbo Rockets. And uh, in terms of general news, we'll be having a March 5th seminar. Uh, there's some the flyers inside the back. And uh, with that, I'll turn, over, turn the floor to Matt now. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, first thing I want to say is I want to thank David for the opportunity. He's done a fine job as president going out and drafting speakers, and I was his first draft. So anyway, and some of you have known me a long time, uh, to your regret, and some of you don't know me. So you have uh, many years to come of regrets. But anyway. What I'm presenting tonight is uh, the addressing emerging missile propulsion requirements with the air turbo rocket. Now, I'm also going to discuss some other requirements regarding uh, nano satellite launch platforms and other things, but I basically cobbled this presentation from a briefing I made around 10 years ago to Raphael in Israel. And they actually flew me over there with the intent purpose of me giving this briefing. And they were more interested in missile applications than launch platforms, for obvious reasons. Uh, next chart. 
the next two charts show all the references I got this information from because this briefing was a derivative of all the work we did. It was important that uh, I only use material that had been previously published in the open literature. And so consequently, these charts are still here. And there's a lot of papers, and some of my colleagues that have worked with me over the years are in the audience. Their names are on these papers, and you can look them up for yourself if you have any, any additional curiosity into the air turbo rocket after I'm done here. Next chart. Okay, this is um, just a fundamental look at the air turbo rocket layout within a realistic missile propulsion environment. And fundamentally, and we'll discuss it a little more, the air turbo rocket is really a hybrid propulsion system that blends the high thrust available in conventional rockets with the excellent fuel economy relative to a rocket that you find in a turbojet. So the combination of these two engine cycles constitute an air turbo rocket. I just want you to look, if you were to look at it from a turbojet perspective, you would see the compressor and the combustion chamber are the kind of things that you see in turbojets. If you were a rocket guy, you would see the turbine and the gas generator slash solid rocket propellant as something you're comfortable with. And so I'm going to just throw out, before anybody asks, if this thing is so good, why haven't we seen it before? Now, a lot of people have a lot of theories, but I'm more of a person that deals in reality. And because I've worked at a turbojet manufacturer and a rocket manufacturer, I learned that there is very little overlap in their thinking processes. So consequently, if you're a rocket company and you want to do an air turbo rocket, you screw up the compressor or the combustion chamber. If you are a turbojet manufacturer, you screw up the turbine or the gas generator. And if you wanted to get it all right, you'd have to bring them together. And if you've worked in those industries very long, you know how difficult it is to get two different engine manufacturers on the same page. So anyway, this is a solid propellant version of the air turbo rocket in which we take the exhaust gas from the solid propellant, we run it through the turbine, and then it exits the turbine into the combustion chamber, and the turbine is mechanically coupled to the compressor, but not thermodynamically or flow coupled. So therefore, all the horsepower the turbine generates is transmitted to the compressor to increase the pressure ratio of the air. The air and the fuel meet in the combustion chamber. What you end up with is a functionally an augmenter, but not with a pressure ratio relative to the atmosphere of 1.03, like you see in after-burning turbojets and turbofans, but a pressure ratio of 3.5 to 4 to 1, which gets you behaving more like a rocket than a turbofan or a turbojet. So that's a quick synopsis. Anybody have any brief questions on that? Otherwise, I'll go on. Yeah, is the um, I guess the salt would is the salt propellant a um, I guess fuel rich? Yes, yes, that's a good point. The solid propellant in the solid propellant version of the air turbo rocket would be running fuel rich. If you had a bipropellant air turbo rocket, like your propellants were, for the sake of argument, LOX RP, then you would be running a <coughs> fuel-rich gas generator in a bipropellant format. The idea being that the exhaust from a gas generator generates power from the turbine, and the exhaust from the turbine, which is still fuel-rich, so there's still enthalpy to be had, mixes with the air that has been compressed to a higher pressure ratio, giving you an afterburner with a very high pressure ratio. 
And when you look at the numbers, we'll talk about the numbers from the standpoint of specific thrust and ISP shortly, you'll see where the air turbo rocket cycle fits relative to the rocket or the turbo jet. Good question. What kind of RPM is the, the turbine and compressor running? It functionally <clears throat> depends on the diameter. The RPM falls out. So in this case, in what you're going to see, we developed and fired a six and a half inch air turbo rocket and our speeds were on the order of about 60,000 RPM. Okay. We also have versions of three inch diameter our ATR, and they will functionally optimize out at around 80,000 RPM. If we had a very large diameter air turbo rocket, its nominal speed would drop. So that depends on the size, and the cycle code will fall out somewhere in that range. And if you wanted to get any clearer than that, you'd have to give me a million dollar contract. <laughs> okay. Next, next chart. So here's a very important chart. It's a fundamental <coughs> chart regarding understanding the air turbo rocket and how it behaves. On the left, we have running fuel in in the main combustion chamber. And on the right, we have fuel rich running in the main combustion chamber. If you looked at the cycle, as you move to the left, you move to an area more like a turbojet behavior. <coughs> turbojet engine behavior is more along the side of the left. And so you get a high ISP and a low thrust per unit airflow. If you move to the right, the limit is a solid rocket. Now, obviously, the thrust divided by airflow in a solid rocket, airflow is zero, so the limit is infinity. So this curve is more of an idealistic curve, and it gives you an idea. And where you move that engine design point dictates where you are as from the standpoint of fuel economy versus specific thrust. And that is something that the mission tells you what you want. Some missions want a lot of boost thrust, and then they also want as good an ISP as they can, so they want to fly more like a rocket. So that ATR will optimize to the right. Some missions, like say a long range, high speed cruise missile, like faster than the Tomahawk, okay, will optimize more to the left. So it, obviously it won't be like a Tomahawk, because the Tomahawk has a turbojet, so its limit is a super good ISP and not very good thrust for your airflow. So it depends on what kind of mission. So in a nutshell, I would say long range, high speed cruise missiles, one an ATR to the left, and a longer range solid rocket motor like a harm missile might want an ATR on the right. Next chart. This is another interesting issue that we came up with. Some missions, range versus time of flight. Understand, time of flight is important, okay? But so is range. So there are many systems that set there, and the range versus time of flight, a solid rocket motor is down here on the left. This gets into what I was talking, where it fits. So on the far left are solid rocket motors, and on the far upper right is a turbojet. And then you have boosted ductive rockets and all these other unique combinations that sit in there. But we've done a lot of numbers over the years, and some of the people in the audience are well aware because they were working with me making these numbers. The ATR is rather unique because it fits in a mission envelope that it's impossible for any other propulsion system to find itself in. So it gets back to, wow, is there anybody that needs that kind of thing? Well, I think they're out there, but generally, I can tell you from experience, they also are already marketing a solid rocket motor or a turbojet or a boosted ductive uh -huh. rocket. So they're not interested in selling something new, they're interested in selling something that's more of the same. 
And if you're a guy like me or some of the people in the audience, like John Bosser and John Bergmans, you know exactly what I'm referring to. Next chart. Here's a little history of the Air Turbo Rocket. Back in the early 80s, Aerojet was working on one, and they had some success, some failure. Um, uh, John Bosser, who's in the audience, was probably participated in some of that. And then we had AMCOM working on it from about 88 to 91. Uh, I was involved in that. Uh, John, to a lesser degree. And then I went to work for CFB Research, and I started writing ATR proposals and had some success, and we did a few things. So that represents 1995 to 2018 is about the last time the CFDRC had a contract. And you can see the progress. We built some engines and we finally fired one. And that's what I'm talking about from the six inch variety. The prior ATR demonstrators were things that Aerojet cobbled together and Amcom cobbled together. So then we've done a lot of, in my opinion, critical component demonstrations we've completed. And we've done a lot of studies on smaller three-inch diameter and larger air turbo rockets, much, much greater than six inches. The biggest one we ever looked at was about 44 inches uh, associated with being a booster on the Pegasus launch platform. Um, next chart. Boy, I've got a big question. Yeah. In all the different, uh, over the years, like the past 30 years, 30 plus years, has there been general trends, not just at CFD Research, but of all the different vendors who have been working on these types? Have there been general trends, like either make them bigger, more fuel efficient? Have they been uh, certain systematic improvements that they've made? As well, as I can only say this. I obviously don't follow literature day to day on all the possibilities, but I will say this. Many different people have looked at derivatives that could be considered related to the air turbo rocket. The English have done some things. Uh, the Russians have done a few things. I've never seen it hit pay dirt where you're seeing them flying on a day-to-day -day mission. I've seen researchers, uh, I think John Bergman's just commented that he read something about the Japanese are talking about it. And the Japanese actually did a very good job of a hydrogen fuel regeneration ATR. They got it working pretty good, but I can only say this. That's about the easiest propellant you could find to use on an ATR. So anybody could get a hydrogen regen ATR going. That's not that tough. The problem is, if you had a hydrogen re ATR regen, then you need a hydrogen fuel tank and how many people want to fly around knowing that it's a hydrogen fuel tank? <laughs> now, my understanding is that since the Hindenburg, people haven't been interested in flying around with hydrogen as their fundamental fuel. Anyway, here's a schematic of one engine demonstrator we built. This particular engine was centered around a solid propellant generator. So the light thing in the back is a big uh, can of solid propellant that we fire, and it's an in-burning grain that burns down, runs through the ATR, works through the cycle, and makes thrust. We never actually got to fire that one, and I have war stories on that. It would take five days <laughs> to talk about, so we won't go there. But we did build this thing. It's still sitting in a storage facility that looks like the same thing that the Ark of the Covenant is. <laughs> so anyway, next chart. We have, uh, since that um, effort, got an opportunity to build and test a bipropellant air turbo rocket in which we were running RP and Gox has the propellants. So we actually fired this thing and started it and ran it. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. 
This is an area out near Scottsboro that we rent. It's where we tested it. Right down there is the test stand where the ATR was setting in that little building with the three bays. And it was configured to put the fuel on one side, the oxygen on the other side, the oxidant, and the engine in the middle. Because we were testing, the Air Force was sponsoring it, and we had to meet all kinds of Air Force safety regulations, isolate things, and all these requirements to have a propulsion test stand, which this situation met. And there in, in the console is in there, so that if the thing blows up, everybody's safe. So we had to be a safe distance away and all that. So that just gives you an idea. This actually exists today, and we actually use it for lots of other things. Um, Next chart. Here is the engine that we actually built and fired. This particular engine, like I said, is a uh, um, Gox RP. So you can see the generator off to the side. That's that little cylindrical thing off to the side. And that is a generator that we're running fuel-rich Gox RP. And then that exhausts into the turbine, which shoots into the engine. And obviously, you could have packaged that gas generator up to the side, and then the hot gas transfer tube would have wrapped around. But that wasn't a requirement in this contract. It was just build an engine and fire it. We weren't trying to build a vehicle-configured air turbo rocket in this case. We were trying to just build something that would work. So that's what the engine looked like. Uh, buried inside that engine is turbo machinery, a compressor, a turbine, a combustion chamber, all that kind of stuff. And there is the engine mounted in the test bay. Next chart. What, what's the performance <coughs> improvement of this rocket versus a regular LOX RP rocket engine? Well, rocket motor. when you look at the numbers, remember, we are, the compressor is ingesting air. And upstream, you can see a bell mouth where we're metering how much air is being sucked in by the compressor. So, in this case, a conventional uh, LOX RP1 ISP might be, what, 280, 300 seconds? What do you say, John? Yeah, 250 to, two, uh, two, 250 to um, two 300 seconds. 250 to 300 seconds is an ISP That's good. That's for good. a... LOX RP-1 rocket. So the ISP for this engine is on the order of about 650 to oh. 750 seconds. Okay? Okay. And the reason for that is because some of the oxidizer we're sucking in, it's in the air. Right. Now obviously this air turbo rocket's not going to work in space. Okay? Yeah. And uh, so of course it doesn't have much value over an altitude of about 100,000 feet. But if you need a booster and you want good ISP to push through the molasses, the ATR is an option. Um, the other thing about the ATR, it's comfortable flying at not too bad of uh, turbine inlet temperatures up to about Mach 4.5 to 5 at 80 to 100,000 feet. And at that point, it becomes suboptimal. But there are many missions that want the kind of ISPs we just referred to at lower altitudes, and the ATR is an excellent choice for that. Uh, next chart. So here is a picture of the engine as we started it and uh, got it running for a little bit. And I have a video. And so. Unfortunately, we don't have good speakers, so if you want to hear the sound, and it sounds, if you're an engine guy like me, it sounds like the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> so be quiet, listen to the noise. It really is a wonderful sound if you're a guy like me and heard a lot of engines work well and some not so well. They went. Go ahead. Let's see if they can lift the speaker up, make it bigger. Hmm. We had the sound going earlier. One second.
they're all different engine runs. Really? I'm not repeating the same run if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Yeah, different ways to turn it off and on and trying to get the feel of how it's going to work. That was a failure. <laughs> Don't ask me about that last one. Does it have an air restart capability? You can run it and then coach and then run. It's never been a requirement, but to the degree, here's the thing. If you've got a bipropellant ATR and you want to invest time in being able to start and restart, you could do it. Okay. Okay? It's not out of the question. Um, but that's never been a requirement, but certainly if you wanted to make that a requirement, it would be possible in the bipropellant version. In the, in the solid propellant version, if you want to start and restart a solid rocket motor, good luck. <laughs> on that. But if you're in the bipropellant mode, to the degree that you're comfortable starting and restarting a bipropellant engine, yes, you could do that. Hey, uh, Matt, I just wanted to comment that uh, this is the first time I've seen these video, thing, video tapes of your engine here, and uh, I just want to uh, applaud you for an, an, an outstanding achievement. This is, uh, there aren't many people that appreciate how hard that is. That's, this is an incredible achievement. Uh, there's very few like this in the world. You could probably count this on your hand. Uh, there's maybe two or three in the world that have ever done this. Uh, and so to achieve this with your, um, with your team and the work you've done is, is a tremendous achievement. And uh, like all great achievements, you know, it's, uh, it will always be sort of underappreciated. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I it, really only, is, it really is spectacular. I will add to that, and I'm still not done. And I haven't given up, and I've got five years left, and I'm trying one more time. And if I get lucky, you guys are coming back. Um, and I can only say this, people ask me, I, I will say this about this achievement. Because I've done a lot of things in my career, whether it's torpedo propulsion, skeps engines, you know. The fuel was sulfur hexafluoride, and the oxidizer was liquid, liquid lithium. So I've been there, and I've been in space. And my first love is turbojets and turbofans. But when people ask me, Matt, what's your greatest achievement? I will say that I was part of the research, development, design, test, and evaluation of an air turbo rocket at CFD Research Corporation, who specializes in computational fluid dynamics. <laughs> so my only thing I want to say is we did all this at a company that specialized in computational fluid dynamics. And that is probably, it would have been much easier if I'd have been at Honeywell or Aerojet doing this. But we still got it done. It also would have been harder because I couldn't have written SBIR proposals to get the funding. And the only government people that were willing to risk something, doing something like this, were only willing to do it under the confines of an SBIR. So anyway. Next part. Here's, we took the engine apart, and here's what it looked like when we were all done. So there's a little bit of wear and tear. We fired the engine 25, 30 times. Mm -hmm. And then we broke it. <laughs> and you got to see the video. You didn't get to hear the last part, but when it's spinning down, you hear this. <laughs> and that was it. OK. What's the, uh, how does the wear, wear on the, uh, on the engine components compared to, let's say, a, a uh, typical commercial jet engine? Oh, well, I wouldn't compare myself to a typical commercial jet because they operate under different uh, operational requirements. I would compare myself to a high-performance military jet um, because the commercial guys got to have duty cycles and wear and tear patterns to keep the public safe. And so a better comparison is the military side of things. So our turbine inlet temperature is measurably lower than what they got to go through. So we get to make it cheaper out of cheaper materials. And so we actually cast our turbine from the start with a low cost casting to prove 
that the potentially most expensive component in the whole engine would be cheap. So, and the reason why it would be cheap is because it was, the target was tactical missiles, right? Not man-rated applications. So if they're man-rated, the game changes. But I can safely say, and I'm sure that my esteemed ATR research colleagues will agree with me, that the ATR has some intrinsic advantages in cost because none of the components demand extremely high temperature for good performance. So here we are, there's a lot of things we could do better on this engine than what we did, and we're still writing proposals from time to time to try to make it happen. So, so what kind of turbine inlet temperature are you using? This particular uh, cycle was running at a turbine inlet temperature of about 1900 degrees. We didn't want to run it cooled. We wanted to use a casting, and we felt that 1850 to 1900 was the highest we would want to go with the duty cycle. Fahrenheit? Yeah, yeah, Fahrenheit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Hey, Amen. Yeah. In your experience, how much, um, how much does the Air Force or the military, the DOD clients, how often do they release proposals or <laughs> release topics that would <sighs> Not very Jeez, often. These are rocket technology. Not very often. It's a lot of time and effort to convince them to do that. And unfortunately, uh, for me to do that, I would have to do it on overhead, and then I have to deal with what's your charge number and all those <laughs> headaches and all that. So um, I, I, I do have people interested in the ATR, but I will tell you this. When the big guys come in, whether they're Aerojet or Northrop or, or GE or Rolls, they have a solution that's more along their product line to meet the propulsion requirements, and they're pushing it, and they got a little more muscle than us, so, uh, or anybody that's really interested in the ATR, so it's very difficult. But we haven't given up. We've made a lot of progress, like John had alluded to over the last 20 years, but there's still a long ways to go. Yeah. What material is your casting? Mar M. Excuse me? Mar M. I'm not familiar. It's, it's, it's a derivative of N canal mm -hmm. that is castable. Okay? And this was many years ago, so we might have gotten better in that arena. So, um, but that's what we did way back then. So if you could have cast it from material that could high, handle higher temperatures, yeah. then you'd have less likelihood that it would have fatigued. No, we would just run hotter and make more thrust than ISP. Okay. And the beautiful thing, in my opinion, about this particular air turbo rocket configuration is that we could cast the compressor and the turbine as one assembly. Or we could 3D print it. And do you know how much money you would save if you could cast your entire turbo machinery assembly in one shot, oh, yeah, yeah you, you can't even begin to calculate that. That's like a new mindset. So that's one of the beauties of this thing. Um, and that's one angle I still take when I'm trying to write proposals to convince people that it's worth investigating. Now, on functionally, a six inch turbojet, that's pretty sporty. Okay, and if we change propellants, we could get even higher. So we were kind of, or we increased our pressure, feed pressure of our RP and our GOX. So at the feed pressures we were dealing with, we were down around six to seven hundred. If we up the pressure, and we could do that because the pressure vessel technologies for both. Lock, we're both for, well, we didn't like to go with locks because we're advertising storables. So we had to find a storable oxidizer, and the best choices are things that nobody likes to touch right now. But if you did, and we have numbers on, say, RP Mon 25, RP Earthna, this kind of stuff, we can get up with this 6 inch ATR, we could get on the order of 1500, 200. 2,000 pounds of thrust if we push the pressure ratio up. Now we're really getting into serious rocket country 
for a six inch diameter. Yeah. You mentioned that the ISP is variable depending on how you design the APR. Where would you put this in the range of ISPs and what would you say the kind of whole range is? I got a chart that will explain that in greater detail coming. I'm going to save that question. Keep it in mind. Ask it again after you see this chart. Next. This is more, we looked at the bearings and the turbine and all this kind of stuff, making sure that uh, everything was comfortable at uh, 60,000 RPM that we selected. And we did, we actually, a lot of this stuff was off the shelf, but we didn't have a lot of money. So every, that bearing race is an automotive grade bearing race. Now, it, was a, it was an auto racing. It wasn't, I mean, we didn't get it down at uh, AutoZone or anything, but we looked and we found a bearing race that we fit around and worked, that we could get off the shelf. So we didn't need a bearing development or any of that kind of stuff. And the seals we used were kind of off the shelf. We had more leads than we wanted, but we couldn't afford another seal development program either. Everything had to work, or at least have a chance of working out of the box. Next, next chart. Okay, this is your question. Your question is very, the propellant and the turbo machinery characteristics dictate the specific impulse versus the thrust in an air turbo rocket. So if you want an air turbo rocket with really good thrust to um, air ratio, you want turbo machinery that has high compression ratio. So you want a axial mixed flow centrifugal type turbo machinery configuration. If you want an air turbo rocket that wants great ISP, you want mostly axial turbine, multi-stage axials. And that's because turbo machinery behaves differently whether it's radio mixed or axial. And now, the other aspect, and that's why I thought an improved turbo machinery pushes you out. And notice propellant. The propellant you pick dictates your ISP and how much energy you can store once it's partially consumed itself. So very low energy propellants are conventional, rich, solid rocket motor propellants. For propellants, you'd burn rich as a solid propellant. They have very low ISPs. And if you improve the turbo machinery, you edge up your ISP. Medium energy propellants, such as LOX RP, these kinds of things, get you around six to 800. Super high energy propellants, like a gas generator that makes a bunch of hot hydrogen, or pure hydrogen, get you at the high ISPs. And that's why the Japanese ATR, it had ISPs of what? What was that Atrex engine? Oh, 1,800, 2,000 seconds. It was the north of two or 3,000. Yeah. The region uh, APRs are very yeah. high ISP. Very high. Uh, but remember, the fuel is hydrogen. Yeah. So, and that gives you an idea. The optimum propellant for an ATR is hydrogen. So as close as you can get to hydrogen is the best. And as you accept propellants, that you can effectively burn fuel rich, like some rocket propellants that you run fuel rich, they're still not as energetic. Plus, there's the question of how efficiently can you burn the exhaust from the turbine. And if the exhaust is full of carbon soot and all that, it's a little harder to burn carbon soot than it is to burn uh, warm hydrogen and all these kinds of things. So some of the efficiencies of the components have, enter into that ISP. Oh, go ahead. What about methane? I like methane. I really like methane. A lot. So running methane fuel rich is really good. Okay? Now, one of the problems with methane is that now you've got to store it. Okay? 
and uh, unless you're storing it cryogenically, you can't store as much. Most people want storable propellants in missile environments. So the dream propellant combination for an ATR is probably, I don't want to say it, but I'll say it, Earthna MMH, fuel rich. Okay. <laughs> Or something like that. Mon 25. Now these ionic liquids that the Air Force has been messing around with for a long time, that are a little easier to deal with than hydrazine, have a lot of potential, but we've never got the funding to look at. And personally, what I believe is an optimal propellant taking into account all the IM compliance and performance and everything like that. And I'm going to give you an idea that Probably I should keep company proprietary because I think it's so great. But if I don't tell this to people, then it'll never happen because we got to get on the, on the stick here. Gel, Mon 25, and some ionic liquid that's hypergolic with gel Mon 25 will make a really fantastic air turbo rocket and be storable. Okay? which is what everybody needs and wants in this arena. And I believe that the combination of one of those really good ionic liquids, which are supposed to behave very similar to hydrazine, but not be near as toxic, because they have a lot of hydrogen and are easy to disassociate, but they're not unsafe, because they're not using the nitrogen molecule to keep the hydrogens collected, they're using other things that won't kill you. And then MOM25, if you gel it, I've known some crazy people that'll sit there and look real close at it without a mask or anything, <laughs> and maybe even touch it, right? And then wash their hands off quickly. Now, I wouldn't do that, but there is an individual that some of us know is capable of doing that. He lives in Huntsville. I think he's still alive, right? <laughs> and Does he still have all his fingers? What? Does he still have all his fingers? Yeah, he does. He does. And he has a video where he's sitting there munching them together and showing how great gels are and all this kind of stuff. And it's true. Okay? So I think a gelling, an oxidizer like MON, plus one of these ionic liquids that the Air Force at Edward Air Force Base has been spending millions and millions of dollars to get right, is probably about as good as we're going to get. Uh, at this time. Next chart. Here's pictures of some of the components that actually set down the engine, just to give you an idea of what they look like. And by the way, uh, John, the engine that we fired, I got rid of the re-entry turbine. Good. It wasn't, it was too much of a headache, so I did rebuild the turbine and I eliminated that re-entry turbine. So well, that was your that was your quite brilliant scheme to uh, get the Air Force to pay for a, a turbine manifold. Was that funky reentry manifold? Was yeah, I, I it was had more to, trouble than it was worth. I had to I propose a reentry turbine to convince the Air Force to fund it because I needed the vote of their turbo machinery guy, and he was in, he was interested in reentry turbines. So if I proposed something he liked, he'd give me the vote I needed to get it <laughs> Matt, that that turbine configuration is pretty interesting. Um, if you could walk people through how that works real fast, I think people would find it interesting. Okay. Well, for those of you that don't know a whole lot about turbines, the turbines that you see in your aircraft engine, they don't look like this. Okay? They're called reaction turbines. This is an impulse turbine. Okay? The difference is that the turning in the impulse turbine, in the area ratio, and the nozzles come in, and these other turbines, they don't turn the flow near as much. This, tur this turbine turns the flow as much as it can to extract as much power out of the turbine in one pass as possible, okay? But they're not as efficient in doing that. So our turbine efficiency on this air turbo rocket, this turbine efficiency, because it's a re-entry, it's probably on the order of um, 65 to 70 percent, and that's really sporty for an impulse turbine. 
The turbines in your aircraft engines, they're multi-stage, their efficiencies could be as high as 80, 82%. That's what they want. And in order to do that, the turbine is conformed a little differently. It looks more like the turbine vanes you probably used to see them if you type in turbine on Wikipedia. Okay? So this turbine is unique. The only place you find these types of turbines are in turbo pumps. Okay? And that's why I say, so told everybody in the beginning, if the rocket boys are working on an air turbo rocket, they're going to get the gas generator and the turbine right. But they don't know anything about how to do this or the, the afterburner combustor relative to a turbojet company. And I'm speaking from experience because I worked at both Honeywell and Aerojet. So I got a good feel about how much Aerojet knows about air breathing turbo machinery. And I got a good feel about how much Honeywell knows about impulse turbines and gas generators. And the biggest reason that they don't know much about those things is because they're not interested in it. Because their market, if you're a rocket, is rockets, not air breathing. Okay? And if you are work at Honeywell, their market is turbo jets and turbo fans, so they're not interested in rockets. So why would they have people employed there in the no lot? What does re-entry refer to? Well, the re-entry means that I'm going to pass, and if you looked at the plumbing closely, that's a great question, by the way. I think that's what John was alluding to. Yep. This turbine is rather unique. Most impulse turbines take one pass through. So they pass through and then they exhaust. In this case, I went two passes. So I came through one side, and then the flow exited, and I had a manifold, and they came back through the turbine when it went out. And it turned out, because of this unique turbine situation where I only needed about a 30 degree pi sector to pass all the flow, because impulse turbines are high pressure ratio, lower flow, so therefore, I need less entry area to pass all the flow through the turbine. Most impulse turbines are, uh, say, what, 20% emission? What would you say the emission? Yeah, the partial emission uh, turbine manifolds uh, on, 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 on rocket type yeah. uh, turbines are, yeah, they're, they're way less than one. So yes. as, long as, as long as you're less than uh, half, right. and you can do a re-entry turbine, you pass right. through uh, two yeah, so what he's referring to is the turbo pump technology that you find out there. Their turbines are impulse turbines, and they have about a 20% emission. Admission. And that means 20%, if you looked at this and you divided by the entire area around, that's about 20% of this whole area. So guess what? That means I can pass through this 20% and come around and go back through the turbine one more time and try to extract a little more energy out of the turbine with the second pass through the same turbine. And the turbo machinery guy that worked at uh, the Air Force was very interested in seeing something like that happen because he hadn't seen it before and he was curious. <laughs> so he forced me to propose that to get his boat. And of course, I'm obviously going to sell out for the money. <laughs> <laughs> the, the compressor turbines? This the top one seems to be just one linear path, but the bottom one has this configuration on the bottom. No, no, this is a compressor. It's obviously full admission, the air comes okay. in. These are partial blades, and this is what compressor guys do. If they, you grab the air, it gets compressed, and then it gets down here, it's expanding out. There's a little more flow area to transfer more, increase the pressure. So you put these partial blades in. It's still full admission. The compressor, that compressor has just got partial blades to increase its performance. Okay. And it increases efficiency. That's why you do that. Very common. Uh, you'll see a lot of compressors with all kinds of different blade shapes, and they put these extra blades in just to get more efficient. Next slide. Okay, next chart. Okay, this is, I'm going to get into the combustor just a little bit. Uh, Aerojet, you showed their ATR. That's kind of what their ATR afterburner combustor looked like. And then AMCOM did a bunch of work, and you'll all be, I'll be, show you that a little bit. And that's what their combustor looked like. So it much, looks much like an augmenter type of combustor design. 
okay? And um, which works okay, but there are better ways to do this, and they are possible in our turbo rocket configuration, so that's what I'm going to show you next. In, in our combustor, we wanted to swirl stabilize the flame because we wanted to uh, reduce the probability of, of wind blowout. And so we knew that we were going to be running lower enthalpy per pound fuel because we're running through the turbine. We've already extracted some of the energy through the turbine. So we're dealing with uh, a fuel that's not like super great high grade fuel. So we want to stabilize the combustion. And so we had some swirlers to improve our combustion efficiency better than what, say, the Amcom engine did or the Aerojet engine did. So, um, next chart. This is the only CFD. I'm going to show you. <laughs> but I do work at CFD Research, so I am under to rest to let you know that we did do a little CFD. And so we did some analysis of our combustor design to make sure that it was behaving the way that I thought it should behave. And it did. We got the recirculation I was looking for. I knew that if I got better recirculation, I'd have more residence time for that lower quality fuel to burn. And it did. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Did actually the CFD simulations ever help? Was it just for interpretation and validation, or did it actually help you refine the design? Or well, I obviously, in this case, because this is my wheelhouse right here. And I've done a lot of CFD and combustor CFD. And I actually, my uh, thesis was on combustor CFD. So I know quite a bit about <coughs> a modeling and simulation design analysis. So yeah, this was a great value to me. It helped me position my swirlers, estimate my pressure drop, flow areas, and all that kind of stuff. And I made sure the CFD uh, was given, indicating the best performance I could have. Next chart. Okay, this is very quick. We have an engine analysis software package. Um, so this is the kind of things you run when you want to look at the cycle. And so, next chart. The cycle is capable of evaluating three different fundamental types of ATR. The first one is the solid propellant ATR, and that was the little schematic. The second one is the liquid bipropellant ATR, which is what we ran. And the third one is what I would call a monopropellant ATR. In this case, it says liquid, but it can be gaseous. And basically, the Japanese Atrex engine, which was all hydrogen, would be considered a monopropellant ATR. So those are the three versions of ATR you can have. And the cycle code is capable of evaluating um, any one of them. The only difference, I, I would say this. The fuel, it says here liquid monopropellant. It says fuel and catalyst. Because, and in the case of the Japanese engine, it didn't need a catalyst, it just had a tank of hydrogen. But some fuels, like if you took, um, say, uh, the ionic liquids in the catalyst, you could have an ionic liquid ATR. And that's fuel catalyzing to make gas, to run through the turbine, then in, go into the combustor, and give, the turbine gives the power to compress it to pressurize the air, and that's how it works. So, we looked at all three cycles, depending on who the customer is, you know, what do they want, that's what we go for. Next chart. Okay, this is a picture of the air turbo rocket that Amcom developed many years ago, and, and I was uh, heavily involved in that effort, and uh, we did fire the engine many times, collected a lot of data. Uh, I got to give my coworker Jay Lilly. How many people know Jay? Okay, Jay Lilly is still there. Um, we worked together many years on this, and we had some successes, and we had a lot of fun. And if you ever want to ask Jay's side, he'll be glad to tell you. <laughs> but Jay's a great guy. He's just, um, I would say, challenging. To work with at times. <laughs> um, next chart. The data we collected under Jay's engine was a very robust engine. It was didn't have the most efficient components, but it worked quite well, and we were able to collect a lot of data on Jay's engine. And we've used that data to validate our model, our engine model. 
So this gives you an idea of our engine model. And here we collected data with Jay's engine running corrected speeds between 30 and 80,000 RPM. There's ISPs. Like I said, Jay's engine had uh, lower energy fuels um, and wasn't the big thrust producer, but we collected a lot of data on this engine. And as a result, we had engine data that we could validate our model with. So this just shows you how validated the model we have with this data. And it's pretty good. We worked very hard to get our code to correlate to Jay's engine data, which was the most comprehensive air turbo rocket engine data set that I'm familiar with. Next chart. Hey, Matt, just a quick, quick question. Is that CFD? You said predicted that the CFD results, or is that like some kind of correlation? That you no, no. That's the code that we developed okay. using engine. James <coughs> engine data. Okay? Next chart. These are flow rates, gas temperatures, there's temperatures, there's flow rates, all kinds of properties associated with the engine are in here. Next. And then we also wrote a code that allows us to do take an ATR engine and package it into some kind of missile configuration. And we called that GEMMA, Global Engine Mission Analysis. Um, so I'm going to go through a few uh, wannabe opportunities ATR engine might be good for if you put it in this missile and fly the missile and try to overcome and see what's good and bad and look at the ATR rocket engine installed within a missile airframe. Next chart. So we're going to look at three. Ground launched fire support which is basically an army missile that pops out of the box and goes where it's supposed to go. The next one is an air to ground, which is basically the harm missile, okay? And the third one is cruise missile defense. So you want to send a missile out to intercept a cruise missile. And I would like to intercept the cruise missile, not when it's bearing down on top of me, but like 30 or 40 miles away. So what do you send out to pick off a cruise missile that has a 2,000 mile um, range, you'd want to pick it off 50 miles down range, not wait till it's right on top of you. Anybody, there's a lot of systems that shoot down a cruise missile when it's right on top of you. But I would like to intercept a cruise missile, especially if it's carrying a nuclear warhead out over the ocean, you know, on its way to New York. You know, well, maybe I'd let it go to New York. Let's say, let's say it's coming for Birmingham. Ah, I want to take it out in the Gulf of Mexico. But anyway, uh, that being said, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about real quick here. Next chart. Here's a little a more about it. A vertical launch out of a container, multi-mission. So this is a container of missiles. And there's a soldier, and he sees it, and he phones up that box of missiles and sends one over to kill the tank. So this is the mission. Next chart. Here we packaged the missile in the propulsion volume. We had two possibilities, depending on how you package the missile. It's in a square box. It's a round missile, so there's that little area. We can drop the ATR down in there. And we, learned some, we flew some trajectories, and the results were two to three times the range of a baseline pentel motor. Now, at the time, people were thinking about a pentel motor, which is a throttleable solid, if you don't know what that is. And so we're looking at replacing a pentel motor with an air turbo rocket, it's an air breather. So we should get more range, and we did get two to three times the range of the pentel motor, depending on the propellant properties. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done to develop the propellants optimally, but they were dual. And so we threw out two to three times depending upon the propellant. Because like I told you earlier, the propellant is a very important factor on ISP. 30% increased cost over the solid rocket motor. So you pay 30% more for your motor than you would for the solid rocket motor, and you get two to three times the range. Is that worth it? Not my decision, okay? <laughs> but certainly it might be and it might not be. <coughs> and we had maximum mission flexibility. I did throw out this. I used to say this about the E-Turbo rocket. In addition to everything else the ATR offers, you could stick a generator on there. Now you have a whole bunch of 
extra electrical power riding along by hooking the generator onto the turbine uh, shaft on the other end and spinning this generator. And you'd be surprised how generators love to make power at 40, 50, 60,000 RPM. That's their sweet spot for efficiency making power. And that's where the ATR likes to run, 30,000 to 80,000 RPM. We mapped that out in all the work that uh, Jay Lilly and Amcom did. Next chart. So here was a flyout results, two profiles. Horizontal cruise, air turbo rocket, pental motor. So this is a powered cruise. Pental motor gives you 13.2 kilometers. ATR gives you 40 kilometers. If on the other hand, you want to boost and fly out and just loft it and get as far as you can, you can get about 50 kilometers with a pental motor and you can get 237 if you loft with an ATR. Okay. Now, in the case of this missile out of the box, those were two possibilities. Next. Here's an alternate ATR configuration in which they said, no, no, we want the ATR packaged in the diameter. You can't have that extra space down in the square. A round cylinder in a square box, you got a little space down there. But if they say, no, this is our choice. We have an ATR. And we have a configured drain, and there's our gas generator packaged in there. And if we want the same range as a pental motor, that's where the pental motor, uh, if we want the same range as a pental motor, remember we fly further, so that's extra payload volume. If you want just the same range as the pental motor, we give you more payload volume. You also have more payload weight because you got more volume. And then you saw what happened if we had the, if we uh, um, utilized, flew the ATR in this and wanted more range, used all the volume dedicated to propulsion. So you have options with an ATR. You can either use that volume. If you want the same range in the ATR, you got more volume for payload. If you want to dedicate the same volume dedicated to pimple motor, you get more range. Those are your choices. We kind of bracketed that. Next chart. Here was something we did on the um, HARM missile. The, I think it's, it's HARM is anti-radiation. What is, what's HARM stand for? High speed. Hmm? High speed anti-radiation. High, anti, yeah, high speed anti-radiation. So this is a missile that the Air Force utilized. I think it's out of production now. It's almost out. But this was a missile that the Air Force used. It was an air-to-ground missile, and it was really designed to uh, allow uh, a, a fighter to launch and take out some uh, mobile radar station and not fly too far into enemy airspace, but pick off a good ground target. So this was a solid rocket motor that really wanted to go a long ways. Next chart. So we, this is a cartoon of an air turbo rocket packaged in the propulsion volume that's available in the HARM missile for propulsion, and they currently have a solid rocket motor. At least they used to have, now they're out of production, but anyway. So if we put an ATR in, that's what it would look like. Next. And it obviously have to be a solid propellant ATR. And here's our results. The current harm range comes in around, and uh, it's classified number, well, we were estimating 25 to 30 miles. And we were in the ballpark. I did authenticate that our estimates were reasonably good. Okay? And by the way, this was published. I remember I presented some of this stuff, and this Air Force guy came up and asked me where I got those estimates of range for the harm missile. And I said, uh, I just estimated them. I mean, I took the information off the internet on the diameter and the motor and I estimated the thrust and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And so by the fact that he asked me where I got them meant that I was at least in the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is our estimates were at least halfway decent. Now if we put our ATR that I showed in there, okay, um, notice the existing range is about 26 miles. If I want to only go 26 miles, 
then I have propellant left over so I can kind of slow down, look around, change my mind. Now obviously the harm can't do that because it's not configured to fly around and wait around. But you could. Or you could fly your max range, which is 60 miles, okay? Which is an average velocity of 1,500 feet per second. And the average velocity of the solid rocket motor is only 1,270 feet per second. Because remember, it boosts, it's out of there, and it runs out of fuel, and it's still gliding in. So I'm under power and flight for longer. So if you integrate the flight time and you divide by your average speed, it's interesting that on many occasions, and I got a chart on this, you come out with an average velocity higher than a solid rocket motor because a solid rocket motor flies really fast and then it's coasting the rest of the way, whereas an ATR is fly power flight for a long time. So if you integrate, you can come up with a higher V-bar. Next chart. Wait. Okay. Loiter at Mach, is it 6 or point point 0.6? Six. Okay, there's a point there. I didn't yeah. see it. Now, I, <laughs> I, I, I put that out only in the sense that, obviously, uh, if you wanted to loiter, you'd have to have a different airframe shape sure. to allow yourself to do that. But loitering at Mach 6 would be tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm saying that that was just an idea, so I want you to put a lot of stock in that. What I'm trying to say is that I can get you the same range as you already got, and I have propellant left over. So if you modified your airframe, you might just want to hang around for a while before you struck. Or you might not. That's really up to you. That's just an idea I was thrown out at the time. Go ahead. Is there a reason or motivation of where around above target, like in case the target moves? You know, I'm not a military condoms guy. So I can only think that the, there, there should be, maybe there is, maybe not. I'm not an expert. But let's give an example. Let's say you've got a high value target and somehow you are watching and you change your mind when you're halfway there. Okay? <coughs> you could do that. Right, so or you want to give yourself a maximum amount of time or whatever. There's a hundred reasons why you'd want to launch and change your mind. Do you have that option? Next chart. Here's a good trade. I love this trade. I hope I don't confuse you. I tried to allude to it. V bar is sometimes a very important aspect. That's the average velocity from launch to hit. What's your average velocity? Now a solid rocket motor gets out of the gate fast. But you know, if you run a 10,000 meter, it don't matter who's in first place after 100 yards. The guy that runs out fast, he never wins the race. Okay? So there's an important crossover, and they were looking at that, for a harm class missile. The average velocity, if you have an ATR, gets above the average velocity of a solid rocket motor at a range of around 25 to 26 miles for a configuration like the Harm missile. That's very important in my opinion because, you know, time of flight's important, right? And so what that says, if time of flight is important at a long range, ATR is better than rocket motor. That's the conclusion, is time of flight means higher V-bar, higher average flight for the length. So that's an important finding, in my opinion, that there's a crossover between a solid rocket motor. And you can see, as the range gets shorter, the V-bar for the solid rocket motor in this application is much, much higher. So the shorter the range, the solid rocket motor is the best. The longer the range, it starts to lose ground. Now we all knew that from the standpoint of air breakers. That's why the Tomahawk doesn't have a solid rocket motor backing it up. But that's because the range was 2,000 miles, whatever, right? But what about those intermediate ranges that start to play tricks on you above 20 to 30 miles? Those are where air breather or rocket or hybrid or whatever start playing. Go ahead. Did you say that your, uh, you assume a, a map, uh, your propellant mass is the same for both uh, the solid rocket motor and the ATR in this example? 
I would say yes to that. Obviously, the propellant that I was utilizing in this example was very close to what the harm was utilizing. And the propellant I was assuming for an ATR was a solid propellant, but of different constituency because it has to have different properties to function in ATR. But as far as the density, I'd say they're comparable. I usually didn't get into that effect if I was looking at solid propellants because it was a second order effect in, when I was looking at the options we had to choose from. But the overall mass for the ATR is higher because you've got the machinery. Yes, but it also has empty space where air is passing through. Be, I mean, there's no mass between the compressor blades. Mm -hmm. There's no mass between all the blades and the ducting. So, yeah, you could study it, make a big CAD model, integrate everything, and find second order differences one way or the other. Next chart. This is the last one. We were looking at an air turbine rocket, and like I told, uh, intercepting an incoming cruise missile, right? And I want to cruise to the loiter area, so I want to get 50 miles out, and then I spot, or I know where the turbojet is, and I go after it. So, based on this mission, my, my mindset, and there are a lot more numbers buried in this mission analysis than what I'm portraying here, but I'm flying an ATR into what I consider to be, uh, quote, a loiter area, or an area where I'm kind of waiting, and I want to intercept the uh, incoming cruise missile, and I fly out 50 plus miles, and I wait for it, and it flies by, and I got about 10 to 13 miles where I catch up with it, and I intercept it and kill it. And that was the mission scenario, and there's a lot more numbers behind this. But the idea of being, and I remember, remember, I remember when cruise missile defense was an important thing, and everybody was interested in it and looking at it. And my idea was, if we had an ATR-powered vehicle, the beautiful thing about an ATR is it can throttle at a lower thrust level and go up to a higher thrust level than a comparable turbojet. And the cycle numbers will tell you that. So, why not take an advantage of that and throttle the ATR back and wait, and when the uh, cruise missile flies by at whatever speed it can go, the ATR now can catch up because it can generate a lot more thrust because it has a super high thrust to uh, inlet area and thrust to airflow ratio much better than a turbojet, and we talked about those numbers earlier. So, the idea being the ATR can catch up with the cruise missile and the nice thing is the intercept can pick up the exhaust and fly right up the back end of the turbojet. And that's the way to intercept something. Not to go for, not to try to hit it in midair or explode something nearby and hope the shrapnel takes it out. And I actually had one cartoon, John remembers that, where I had an ATR and this arm and hammer guy came out and smacks the incoming Russian cruise missile right in the head. Right? And that was kind of a joke. But the fact is, that you could intercept, you could utilize an ATR to intercept and zero in on the exhaust of think, the enemy. I think vehicle. the Ruder cartoons were funnier on that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, next chart. This is the last one. I got another video. This was later on, and I was looking at an air turbo rocket for a nano satellite launch platform in which we had picked the Teledyne menace vehicle, and this menace vehicle was going to be something that flew around and was a target for people to shoot at and play with and all that. So this menace vehicle would pick up a target. I should say the menace vehicle wasn't the target. The menace vehicle was the carry vehicle for the target. The menace vehicle picks up this target, drops it off, and it flies around, and we shoot, practice shooting it down with whatever we got available, and that's the idea, to shoot it down. But the idea here is replace the target that the menace vehicle is picking up with a nano satellite launch platform that utilizes an air turbo rocket engine to boost it from where it's dropped off at, which could be wherever the menace wants to drop off at. And I got a video where I was looking at a drop point of say, I think it's around 30 to 40,000 feet and like Mach 1.2 or something like that. So you get 
a Q to that level, then you take the ATR and it gets you up to around 100 to 120,000 feet and uh, Mach, trying to remember, seven or eight, and then the ATR either flies back or falls off, and then you have a solid rocket booster to get you into orbit. So let's go to the video. And sure. there's a whole bunch of numbers and analysis and a whole big fat report on this backing it up. So uh, what you're going to see is a video that a very creative uh, intern helped us make. <laughs> Wood worker SpaceX. Yeah. Besides being really cool, what advantage would this have over other approaches to getting a nano satellite? Is it more reliable? Is it cheaper? Well, is the idea safer? being, and there's a lot of information in the report, but the objective was lowest cost, rapid turnaround, storability, and the Menace platform, you saw it's launched off a rail with MRLS boosters, so you launch one of the things. The Menace platform was reusable, so after it drops the ATR payload, which you saw, it flew back, landed, gets recycled. Whether the ATR flies back or not is a good question. We always put it in that we could fly it back, and you could. The only thing that doesn't fly back is the last stage solid boost and obviously the satellite. So the issues were a cost for constantly launching another, launching another. And this was back when people were thinking about, we want to launch hundreds of nanosatellites and we want to have a giant spider web of these things watching everybody. Or maybe you want to launch it into geosynchronous orbit, which it'll decay at some point, so we've got to get another one up. We will put it right there. Wherever we want to put it, and it lasts long, and when it falls out, we put another one up. So this was kind of the motivation. So the idea being they wanted something that if they decide to launch, they can get it up in the air in 24 hours, and all they got to do is bring the payload over there, drop it on, 
wheel the cart out, and they wanted a mobile launch platform, so obviously this is on a trailer, and now you can drive the trailer anywhere in the world and launch from there. Because if you want to launch in geosynchronous orbit, you've got to pick the right launch location. You, it's harder to get something if you launch everything from Cape Kennedy or whatever, or, you know, <coughs> Vandenberg. It'd be nice to launch from anywhere. So the idea here is that you can launch from anywhere if the launch vehicle is portable and it's small enough and you can't launch big satellites from anywhere, but you can certainly launch small ones, but your vehicle had to be ready to go. So the ATR has storable propellants and the F-110 engines are cheap. You can grab all theirs and throw them away faster than they can find places to dump them. And so there's a lot of useful aircraft engines that are being decommissioned and set in storage. And actually there were about, I don't know, 10 or 12 F-110s when it was being done. People were excited about it. They had 10 or 12 F-110s. I think the Navy dumped them on the Air Force, and I think they might still be sitting on the arsenal somewhere. What are we going to do with these things? Why do we need these things, right? So if you looked at this whole infrastructure, there's a big report talking about all the reusability, and they were commandeering all kinds of parts to make this. And so this had some legs for a little bit. Then it died out because people found better ways to launch nano satellite launch platforms, or maybe Boeing or somebody, you know, uh, Elon SpaceX, Musk. all these guys SpaceX, yeah. are in there competing with their ideas. And so I don't know, I didn't keep up with it because things are always changing. Next chart, I think we're almost done here, by the way, out of that video. I think this is it. I think the last chart. Air turbo rocket, excellent specific <laughs> impulse, two to four times greater than a rocket. Superior static air breathing specific thrust, 150 to 200 pounds or seconds per pound mass. Just to let you know, the after burning turbo jets, the red hot turbo jets that everybody gets has all these uh, F -35, F-35s running, probably that's probably about 90 to 100 pounds per seconds per pound mass. Mm -hmm. So we're better than the hottest turbo jets out there. And we cost a whole lot less because our temperatures are a lot lower. Okay? But when we're not on afterburn, as a turbo jet on afterburn versus a turbo jet flying, uh, at, we don't have the fuel economy when the turbo jet is not on afterburn. If the turbo jet's running normal, and we're running normal, turbo jet have better ISP, unless we have a really great fuel, like hydrogen. But like I said, nobody wants to fly hydrogen. So. Anyway, I like to say my analogous um, to these two are the air turbo rocket is half as good as a rocket motor from a specific thrust point of view and half as good as a turbojet in an ISP point of view. So that's the cup half empty. Or I could say the air turbo rocket is twice as good as the best turbojet in specific thrust and twice as good as the rocket motor in ISP. And now that's the cup half full. And smart people can take advantage of these facts and portray you in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Independent turbine drive, independent from the compressor, from the standpoint of the gases that go through the compressor, don't go through the turbine, provides deep throttling, i.e. we can throttle the air turbo rocket down lower than the turbojet guys can throttle. Okay? That's important in many <coughs> situations. Castable monorotor turbo machinery IM propellants, tubular combustor, simple feedback control minimizes cost. So this tur air turbo rocket is much lower cost than a comparable turbo machinery based engine. This was one turbo electric power for all missile seeker battery fins, all that. If you put a generator on the A-turbo rocket on the other end, you got copious amounts of electric power, more than you could ever dream of in a missile environment. And we know how hard it is for missiles to find 
electric power. I think that's it. <coughs> You first? Yeah, you, on all of your uh, solids that you showed in your presentation, they were all inverters? Basically, any, yes. And the reason um, for that rather than perforated cores? All, the work we did in originally in the first solid propellant air turbo rocket was all inverter focused for a number of reasons. So. I'm not precluding any other grain configuration. I'm just saying the only thing we invested any time in was in burner. So I believe that there are certainly other ways to cast a propellant grain. I'm sure you'd agree with that, right? You know? The inverted grain is particularly advantageous to the air turbo rocket because it provides the most uniform burning conditions, especially if you want to throttle it. You know, you really don't need a CP grain for for these kind of things. Uh, in fact, they they tend to be more trouble than they're worth for this application as a gas generator. Okay, then he's next. What's the uh, ratio between what your turbine gases are that you're running through the turbine uh, versus what you're bringing in from compressor air and um, which fuel you're pushing into the post combustion? That is a profound question. <laughs> so let me give you a profound answer. It can vary quite a bit. Understand this, if you want an air turbo rocket with really good static boost, okay, you need a higher pressure ratio compressor. When you go to higher pressure ratio compressors, you usually give up flow, right? So, if the mission requires a big turndown ratio in thrust, and you're forced to a more of a mixed flow compressor arrangement like the one I showed, because under those conditions, we were being forced into those kinds of pressure ratios. So that dictated a mixed flow compressor. Um, that's where that happens. Now, we've looked at missions, and I am familiar with uh, one effort, and it's not really an ATR like we're looking at, but it's similar in nature, and they're using a three-stage axial. So if you use a three-stage axial, and each stage is on the order of 1.2 or 1.3 to 1 pressure ratio, that's 1.2 to 1.3 cubed, that's your pressure ratio, it's on the order of 2, guess what? They have more through flow, so they have higher ISP, but lower boost thrust and lower thrust turndown ratio. So that turbo machinery question is really governed by the mission and the compromise that I showed you between turbo machinery and um, propellant ISP and what kind of ATR you want. And like I showed that chart where you move towards a turbojet or you move towards a rocket. If you move an ATR more towards a rocket, you want a higher pressure ratio compressor, which pushes you into a centrifugal or a mixed flow compressor. If you want an ATR with a, a better, a higher ISP, but lower specific thrust, you're pushed in the direction of axial turbine and more turbine through flow. So, I know that was a longer answer, but I had to frame the answer in the context of the flexibility. So what's the, what's the ratio of the, so you inject more fuel in to, to get most burning, or are you only using the turbine fuel uh, with the air or something? Um, we have looked at Addition, carrying additional onboard fuel and or oxidizer, and it's very interesting you asked that question because I talked about that equivalence ratio and where the design point is, and you want fuel rich and fuel lean and how you run it, and there will be occasions where you want to inject additional oxidizer in the augmenter to maximize everything, and there will be conditions where you want to inject more fuel. And it's interesting that um, you bring that up because I've looked at both, and the answer is it could be A or B or neither. And it really depends on where the cycle's pushing you, and once you're pushed to the pressure ratio that the, the mission wants, now you want to squeeze a little more out of it, okay, and, and you could, after you're done optimizing everything, you could carry along a little extra fuel, dump it in the combustor, or a little more oxidizer, dump it in, and that's a secondary trade that is well worth investigating if you got the time <coughs> and money. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I'm a 
Anybody else? Oh, you have one. Uh, I was just wondering, if you throttle a solid fuel, doesn't that build up the pressure in the in the solid motor? Well, <laughs> we actually got funded to deal with that issue quite well, and that can be overcome, and it's been done. And the pendle motor guys are actually doing that quite well now, and the ducted rocket guys weren't doing it so well. Then uh, John Bergman's was the PI, he's sitting right there, who came up with the controller to uh, more carefully modulate that difficulty. And I don't want to step on John's work, so if you want any more, if you have any more questions about that, he's sitting right here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So you kind of went into it. I was going to ask you if you're still working with the Pinto rocket motors. Oh yeah, most definitely. We are firing our latest and greatest Pinto motor configuration. Um, at uh, Northrop on February 27th, and then we got one more grain. Where's that at? Yeah. Where's the location? What? Where's West the location? Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah, the Rocket Center, West Virginia. Okay. Okay, and we are working with them on a um, Army potential Army uh, configured pencil motor that the Army might find of value. We don't know. Right now, we're just doing development testing, but yes, we're still working on pinnacle motors. Okay, so how are y'all funding that? Hmm? Or is it still uh, SBIR? Army, or... RIF, SBIR type money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, one point though, the uh, you mentioned uh, uh, SpaceX and all these guys launching microsatellites. There's still a ma market for a dedicated, specific launch of a microsatellite to dedicated orbits, instead of the, the big bus launches like SpaceX will be done. Yeah. Yeah, I believe there should be on a one z two z basis at any location in the world. Yeah, it would be nice. You could drop a big trailer off and and maybe get it out there. That's what this menace thing was all about. Was a mobile nano satellite launch platform. Yeah, there should Minimum still be a market cost. for that. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, you know yeah. SpaceX is looking at launching large constellations. That's a different matter. Yeah, you could you could go off a ship at, at equatorial. Uh, at, at, at the equator yep. and do the same thing. Looks like a guided missile cruiser. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And frankly, you know, Teledyne has the most gain from that because we're leveraging their menace vehicle, which they put a lot yes. of time and effort to get there. We were only piggybacking off of it. And so Teledyne is still looking at this, and every once in a while they call me up and, you know, it's another you know proposal wave and we wait. And, Maybe we win, maybe we lose. Yeah. Uh, is the Teledyne Brown still working on the Menace system in some various form or another? Is that something that they're still active doing, or is that sort of like um, hit them off all Yeah, time? it's kind of been gotten, came back in the last three to four months. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's back. You know. I don't know if it's back big time or more threats. For sure. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I'm going I'm to make a comment and then I'm going to ask a question, Matt. So I don't know if you know much about the backstory, but Matt, uh, Matt actually was, was uh, my first boss here in Huntsville. He hired me and he hired John to work on the air cover rocket, you know, a couple of decades ago now, the mid-90s. But at that time, there wasn't a lot of air cover rocket work going on. And Matt Thomas single-handedly uh, started putting programs together in that time frame, in that early 90s. And, and he was one of the few guys in the country that was doing that work and was able to pull those programs together. So it's a real, uh, you know, you, you got to really admire, Matt, I really admire your, your pioneering spirit and your, your, uh, your uh, unstoppable uh, will for just, you know, keep trudging along. Uh, you know, all us Air Cover Rocket guys, we, uh, you know, we're the redheaded stepchildren of the Propulsion Olympics, you know, and so we, uh, and the rocket guys don't like us because we have too many turbojet parts, and turbojet guys don't like us because we have too many rocket parts. So, be able to proceed uh, and, and continue on is really a, a credit to your perspicacity uh, and uh, and, the, and the, the stuff you've generated. It's really uh, quite remarkable and, and really an accomplishment, and it's really a treat to be here and hear some of your stories. So I, I wanted people to know that because it's, it's well. Nice. Thank you, John. We went through a lot of hard times. Yeah, it was. Uh, and but we had a lot of fun. Too. We had a lot of fun. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears, mainly blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question was, uh, tell us a little bit about your, what you see as the future of the air turbo rocket. 
uh, where some of its applications may go, uh, not just in you know uh, uh, munitions and, and military stuff, but uh, you know uh, high-speed air breathing flight, uh, maybe space access, stuff like that. Tell us well, some of your views for that. Right now, and this now we're going to get into my opinion. Okay, the most interesting. and it may not be the equivalent of other people's opinions out there, but. It's my opinion, and I didn't show you this, but we had looked at the air turbo rocket, and I tried to convince people the air turbo rocket is the ultimate scramjet booster. Cool. And the reason for that is manyfold. Number one, it has sufficient static thrust to get a scramjet off the ground and then fly and boost the scramjet to a takeover speed of around Mach 4.5. Now, right now, it's my understanding that most people are more interested in using a high-end turbojet or other combined cycle approach to boost the scramjet. And that's fine, but guess what? They start getting uncomfortable about Mach 3.5. And that's when the temperatures and the pressures get too high for a lot of the turbo machinery components to deal with, unless you go to unobtainium or other materials that have brittleness properties or other properties that are unfavorable for transport on the way. So what do they do? They drop the scramjet takeover speed requirement to the point where they can barely get it off of a turbojet. And now the scramjet takeover speed is compromised. And therefore, the scramjet, if it has to go from Mach 4 to Mach 7, that's a hell of a lot harder than going from Mach 4 and a half to Mach 7. And I'm not a scramjet guy, but I do know that's a fact. So, I believe the ATR is really, a, we'll find a spot for anybody that wants a scramjet powered vehicle, but they got to get it up to a suitable <coughs> scramjet takeover speed, and they don't want to spend a lot of money on the propulsion system to get there, and their only options right now are what is being sold has a super high powered turbojet, or some combined cycle something. And there are a lot of other options out there. And if you ever want to go to sleep and sleep well, just start reading about it. <laughs> I think uh, we've got time for one or two more questions and maybe I have to wrap it up. But I, okay. I want to make a quick question for you. That, that uh, menace based launch platform, did you guys have a requirement for recurring cost permission that you had to Yes, make? we did. And there are numbers that yeah. we published along that line. Yeah, well, what was that? What was your what was your requirement? Because I, I was thinking there's something I would I might help respond to on this same requirement. So I was just I was like ten million a million dollars per flight, or was it? Uh... No, no, it was a cost per flight, and it was a turnaround time. And I think it was, and I could be wrong here. I'm just guessing. And I I feel what I should have done is I should have dropped another chart in that had a little itemization of that. But I think. The requirement was four million per get it out there, right? With a rapid turnaround. With this yeah. turnaround and everything. So we came in a little less than that. The requirement was four million. If the cost, the recurring, if we can recover the uh, menace vehicle and recover the ATR, and it don't take much to fix them up, then we're under that. But we all know. That the shuttle was supposed to be. So I'm not gonna say I I felt we were in that ballpark, mm -hmm. and because the shuttle was supposed to be reusable, and a lot of people in Huntsville especially know how reusable the shuttle really was. Uh, I'm Dave Hewitt. I'm the vice president. I wanted to say thanks to Matt for coming out and giving him a round of applause. <laughs> Upcoming events, I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, we have flyers.
tires at the back for our next meeting. We got uh, Dr. Gabe Shu from UAH talking about electric propulsion, uh, March 9th. And then for our April meeting, we have a special uh, educational STEM education related thing that's coming up that our new education chair, Alicia, has put together. And it's going to be a poster session for students to bring the research and poster workshop. And it's going to be in here. And uh, there's going to be, um, it's open to all senior, junior, sophomore, and freshman, college and high school students and professors. So Alicia is doing a heavy recruiting pitch right now to get, get the young researchers out here to, uh, to uh, uh, present for that. So that's, those, those are just two events coming up I want to let you all know about. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess we'll conclude tonight's talk and thank you, Matt, again. Okay, thank you, everybody. And thank you for watching.